have everybody please take your seat. The hearing board is going to start. Good morning, everybody. Please have a seat. We're going to have some technical difficulties, but you guys are just going to keep powering through. You got it. Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, good morning and welcome to the uh, Herring Board. My name is Pat Kelleher, the chair. Um, we've got a fairly quick agenda uh, in front of us, but first I, um, I, I don't know if uh, the host state would like to welcome everybody. I think we're somewhere in New Hampshire. Yeah, thank you very much, and we do would like to welcome you all. We, we uh, arranged yesterday to have uh, a classic uh, New Hampshire Nor'easter come through, just so that you felt right at home and how we feel and stuff. We're, uh, we've got a lot of uh, good things planned for this week, uh, both uh, work-wise and how, what we need to accomplish uh, here as a commission and also social-wise. Uh, I think uh, we have a... a a good reception plan for tonight here at the hotel and then on on uh uh, Tuesday night, we're going to go over to the Elks Club and have a good old uh, lobster feast. Um, and we're going to have New Hampshire-sized lobsters as opposed to Maine-sized <laughs> lobsters. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you, the uh, the uh, dress code for uh, Tuesday night is casual. Please, casual. You don't come to a lobster bank with a suit on. <laughs> So welcome, everybody, and thank you for coming. Thank, thank you, Doug. Um, I just want to give everybody a heads up. We do have some AV technical difficulties. Um, we are going to not wait for them. We're going to kind of power through. There may be some delays um, with the visuals when we get into the slides, but uh, we'll, um, we'll adapt here as we move through the program. Um, Item number two on the agenda is um, approval of the agenda. Is there any um, any changes to the agenda? Seeing none, the agenda is approved. Um, proceedings uh, of the April 2019 meeting, is there any um, corrections that need to be make, made to those minutes? Seeing none, those minutes are approved. Public comment. We do have uh, one individual, Jeff Kalin, who has signed up for public comments for items that are not on the agenda. Is there anybody else in the audience that would like to speak? Seeing none, Jeff, why don't you come right up to that public microphone, please? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, and uh, good morning to the uh, to the hearing board. Yeah, I just um, wanted to bring to your attention um, a letter that uh, we wrote to the EPA on October 18th, and I copied Bob on it, but it didn't get in the supplemental materials. And it's comments on the EPA designation of an ocean dredge material disposal site for the southern Maine, New Hampshire, and northern Massachusetts coastal region. And in the Federal Register notice of September 18th, the EPA says that this uh, site would have minimal potential for interfering with other existing or ongoing uses of the marine environment, including fishing activities. And it's not a unique fishing ground or highly significant fishery harvest area. But I understand it does overlap the um, western Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire spawning area. And so uh, we asked the EPA um, to evaluate to the extent the site overlaps with the closed areas in the Gulf of Maine, particularly the western area, um, whether or not the proposed site specific impacts um, may be significant. So that's on the record um, sent to Bob, and I just wanted to raise it today, and, and maybe it could be evaluated by the technical committee um, to see to what extent it overlaps and what the bottom is like and whether there's some potential for smothering herring eggs out there. So um, that's the issue I wanted to put on the table today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Jeff, thank you for those comments. Um, 
I know states specifically will comment on those um, from an individual basis, um, but I think uh, that there is no, I don't believe there's anything tasking that's been done with the, with the TC. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that um, uh, to see if it would be appropriate to bring them forward. Does, does anybody have any comments uh, on the issue that Jeff has brought up at this time? Dr. Pierce? <laughs> I'll, I'll only, uh, echo the point that you just made that it seems to be an issue of importance that we need to address as an organization, the C hearing board. So, uh, with your um, with your uh, instruction, Mr. Chairman, I would I would suggest that the technical committee take a look at what has been proposed and prepare some comments for uh, for submission. I don't know what the deadline is for receipt of comments by EPA, but um, and I don't know how much they're intending to dispose of. Uh, and where, but um, so I would I would encourage you to um, charge the the TC to take a look at this. Thank you, Dr. Pierce. Is there any objections to charging the technical committee to look at the issues uh, that have been raised in the Federal Register by the EPA? Doug Grout. No objections, but uh, uh, we've been well aware of this and been involved with the uh, siting of this. Um, in our state, and uh, we feel fairly comfortable about this, that the Army Corps and the EPA have, have looked at the uh, areas um, for the marine resources, but uh, it might be good just to take a look one more time, and I can have Sheree Patterson take a look at things as to whether we evaluate it for egg presence for, for herring. Great, thank you. I don't think this is going to be a big draw of time on the on the TC. I believe uh, Maine DMR has also uh, has also looked at that. So um, we'll have the uh, TC look at it if there's no objections. Um, seeing none, let's uh, let's continue to move on through the agenda. So, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, just um, it was a, the uh, comment period in the proposed rule closed October 18th. So um, I'm sure you know there's going to be a final rule. So there's time to work with them. But uh, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Appreciate that. Appreciate you bringing it forward. Is there any additional public comment? Seeing none, we're going to go to item number four, which is a progress update on the 2019 Atlantic Herring 1A fisheries performance. Renee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning and welcome to New Hampshire. Um, so I'll just quickly review the performance of the 1A fishery thus far this year. We have a lovely picture of actually the state of Maine inshore trawl survey this year, so of our local herring. Uh, so our total season tack for herring was 3,850 metric tons in area 1A, and that took into account the uh, 39 metric tons for the fixed gear fishery, 8% for bycatch, basically the areas closed at 92%, uh, and 131 metric tons for research set aside for herring. The board chose to uh, pursue bi-monthly periods for this year for the first time. So we were working with four periods. The first period was May and June with no catch allocated to May, July and August, September and October, and period four we are in very shortly and that will be November and December. And the breakdown of how that worked, there's specific percentages allocated to each of those bi-monthly periods. Just as a reminder, uh, there are different management tools available during different times of year. So for period one through the first half of period three, this is a little bit odd because we uh, traditionally have gone in trimesters and the trimester ends at the end of September. Now September is one of a bi-monthly period that ends at the end of October. So this can get a little bit confusing. But so the tools available for the period starting in June and ending in September are uh, choices for Category A vessels. The board may choose landing days, weekly landing limits per vessel, uh, the use of carriers. For Category C and D vessels, landing days are the options for management tools. The second half of Period 3 and Period 4, uh, the only option available to the board is landing days. So that, again, starts October 1st, so it's partway through one of our periods, which is a little bit um, a little bit confusing. 
So for period one and two, we actually rolled, or the board chose to roll period one TAC into period two. So the TAC allocated to June was rolled into the July-August period, which resulted in 2,175 metric tons available for that time frame. That period opened on July 15th and went to zero landing days on August 19th. The options that were chosen for the category A vessels during that time frame were four landing days. Also, they were limited to possessing herring taken from 1A during those landing days. So effectively, those were landing and fishing days. 160,000 pounds per vessel per week. Harvest to harvest transfer only. The use of carriers was prohibited during this time frame. There were 11 category A vessels that participated in the fishery during that time frame. Category C and D vessels were uh, limited to five landing days, and there were six vessels participating. For period three, the period we're currently in, uh, the allowable catch for September through the end of October was 1,309 metric tons. That period opened September 2nd and went to zero landing days on September 15th. The options chosen by, by the board were identical to that of period two, and the same number of vessels participated in the fishery during period two and period three. Period four, that's the period we are headed into here very shortly. Um, there's a slight overage in period three. So while originally we had 366 metric tons allocated, um, 295 metric tons are remaining currently, and likely that number will drop by about 50 metric tons due to an overage that was yet to be reported at this point. Um, all vessels will open on November 2nd, but that is pending a transfer of catch from uh, Garfo will either transfer a catch of 1,000 metric tons or not, depending on the performance of the New Brunswick weir fishery. So if they catch under a certain threshold, that management uncertainty comes back into the 1A fishery. So if that does not happen, the board will have to make a decision. Um, until that happens, period four will remain at zero landing days as it stands right now. And this is actually, a, a, this has been recently updated, so should that happen, they currently have it moving to one landing day, not two. This is just taken from Garfo's website. This shows you the 1A fishery this year. So you can see that we're very close to the, to the end of the fishery at that 92% line, which is the red line. Um, just a quick overview of how the spawning closures went this year. Eastern Maine, there were no samples. We knew this year would be difficult with the low quota to get adequate samples to be able to project spawning instead of closing on default dates. So all our areas actually closed on default dates. So this area closed on August 31st on the default date, opened again on September 13th. Western Maine, there were two samples. Uh, the sample threshold is three for being able to project, and that's if the information produces an estimate that's precise enough to do that. So this also closed on its default date, which was September 23rd, and it will reopen on November 4th. Mass New Hampshire spawning closure. This did have four samples, which is over the threshold, but the precision was not good enough to project. So the p-value is far greater than 0 0.05. I think it was 0 0.11. This closed on the default date as a result of that, which was September 23rd, and it will reopen on November 4th. And that is all I have today, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Renee. Any questions for Renee? Dr. Pierce? Yeah, Renee, uh, regarding the area, the um, period three overage, to what extent uh, was that overage caused by that uh, violation cited by the uh, Maine Marine Patrol? That number did not include the violation. That would be approximately an additional 50 metric tons. Any additional questions? Mr. Train. Thank you, 
you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Renee, I know normally we, well, I, I don't know if it's Renee, if I should ask Pat. Normally we will add any overage to the following year or it will come off the quota, but if we know we have an overage from a violation, shouldn't that be added in now? So I believe the state of Maine, I've seen a letter that's been submitted to GARFO to request that to happen as soon as possible. Um, I don't know if NOAA Fisheries wants to speak to that. We, we do have a letter that submitted. It was part of the supplemental. Um, we have not heard back, but I don't know. Allie, do you have uh, any comments? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I got um, an email update this morning. I think we're still trying to figure out exactly how to account for that in our monitoring, um, but we will be using it, we will be accounting for that in our projections, and we're looking um, for a way to, to build that overage in. So um, more to come, but we're working on it. Great, thank you for that. While, while your microphone is on, um, can you tell me time-wise as far as any transfers from the Canadian fishery? Um, we are working on that package as I updated folks on the on the days out call. Um, we were routing it um, kind of without numbers last week as we finalize or we're working with Canada to finalize those numbers. Um, so it's all set and ready to go and um, you know, fingers crossed in the next few days um, it publishes. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Any additional questions for Renee? Seeing none, let's move right on to uh, item number five, which is an update on the development of the Council's, the Northern Council of Georgia Bank spawning protection discussion. Um, and Deidre Bolke is here to give that Hi. presentation. Thank you, Deidre. Good morning, everyone. My name is Deirdre Bolke. I work on the New England Council staff. I'm the plan coordinator for the Atlantic Herring Fishery Management Plan, so I'm happy to be here. I was talking with Kirby several weeks ago about this section of your meeting, and and we thought it would be helpful if I came, since it's not that far away from our office in Newburyport, to update you on where the New England Council is with this topic. We know this is very important to this commission. You've discussed it over the years as well. So I'm here to update you about where the New England Council is and to kind of review some next steps. There is a draft report that was available in your materials that was provided in advance. And then I do have several slides that will just touch on that. It's a lot of information. I'm going to be trying to go through it pretty quickly. So uh, there's an opportunity for questions. I'm happy to stay after because I will not have time. This is a pretty short agenda to really dig into the, the nuts and bolts of the report. But I will stay afterward if, if you'd like to hear more. So just to give you a little background, the New England Council did identify this as a priority for 2019. So we've been working on it really in the second half of the year. This was um, decided we didn't want to fall behind. This was important to a lot of people, so we actually solicited a contract to help us fast track this topic. The Gulf of Maine Research Institute was the successful award, went to them in May, and we've been working with Dr. Graham Sherwood, Ashley Weston, and Aaron Whitman, three staff from GMRI. It has gone very well, and they've been working over the summer and then really kind of working on the analysis, and then this fall we've been working through our Council and committee and PDT to finalize the report. The scope of this work really was to review the historical and current scientific research and other relevant info about offshore spawning of Atlantic herring. So it was very general, and the report probably in the end will be about 75 pages, a lot of figures, a lot of analysis is included in it, and this work was brought to the plan development team for the Council in August, and then subsequent meetings with industry advisors and our herring committee. More recently, the council got a draft report in September, and since then, the report is pretty much almost finished. We'll be bringing it back to the New England Council in December, but we're just kind of uh, polishing it, and so that will be on track to be completed this year. And the council, just to let you know, did initiate an action. I'll talk about that at the end of the presentation for next year to, to work on a measures to protect Atlantic's spawning of herring offshore. The brief outline of the report itself. The first few sections are not complete in the report that you received. Uh, they are more complete now, uh, but there's going to be some helpful background information about what we do know about spawning of Atlantic herring, the different management actions that have been considered over time. There's also some 
information from other regions and other spawning um, information that we can learn about other measures that are used um, locally as well as ab abroad. But really the core of this analysis was to, to try to bring all the data together, really look everywhere, see what we could find, and these researchers from the Gulf of Maine Research Institute uh, did that for us. So the idea was to see if when all the data sources were put together, there was any kind of consensus or general area, anything, any trends that we could, we could find. So it's essentially a mapping project, taking all this information, putting it into GIS, and producing different figures of this data. So the main sources are on the screen. There were six different data sets that were analyzed. The first was a very extensive data set from Maine DMR and Massachusetts DMF have been collecting portside data, as you know very well at this table, for many years. And so all of that information was, was reviewed for just the offshore regions, so not including Area 1A. All the other regions were uh, kind of evaluated for the, the GSI values and the maturity stage of Atlantic herring port side. <clears throat> Excuse me. As well, the Northeast Fisheries Science Center also has an extensive database of bottom trawl information, as you know, and that was reviewed for any information about um, maturity of herring. The third data set was larval toes have been taken in this region for many years, and those were reviewed specifically for small, uh, small herring larvae, very tiny, less than nine millimeters. The diet database, we also evaluated to look at fish stomachs that the Northeast Fishery Science Center keeps. They evaluate um, kind of the contents of, of stomachs, and that was investigated to see if there were any records of herring fish eggs. And finally, herring EFH. We do know, um, you know, have a sense of where the herring EFH important areas are offshore, so that was evaluated. And finally, there are some historical maps and information, and we looked at those figures to see if they were kind of jiving with our more updated information. This group also interviewed industry stakeholders. Uh, a few less than 10 individuals were interviewed to share their ideas about where there may be spawning areas offshore and any other input they had about this topic. And then finally, which is useful for this commission, the plan development team, which by the way includes the entire commission technical team, discussed possible research recommendations. We're aware that there are some some funds that the Commission has set aside to help support this work, and so there are some recommendations at the end of possible ways to survey and support this topic. Not going to go through this in detail, but just to let you know, this gives you a feel for the extensive amount of data that was available and included in this report. Over 50 years of information, thousands and thousands of fish and toes completed from these various uh, sources were all combined in, in this analysis, and this just gives you a sense of, of the richness of this information. Very, I have one slide for each of these topics just to give you a feel for the information that's included in the draft report. Starting with the main DMR port side data, the Massachusetts data, as I mentioned, was also reviewed, but it is not as long. So we'll just show you um, the main DMR as an example here. Uh, over the last several decades, over 17,000 fish have actually been measured uh, for their GSI level, and that's what's mapped on the screen. So you can start to get a sense of the core places where the more mature spawning fish are showing up, the ripe and running herring. Uh, you see kind of along the northern edge of Georgia's bank and kind of these two nodes as well as a little bit um, south of, of Rhode Island as well. There was so much data there, we were able to break it out by month, which was very informative as well. This is a heat map of all the different GIS values for a particular year, the mean GSI, by month. And, you know, it's pretty clear that September and October, those are the dark red. Very consistently, year after year, this is when the GSI values are highest in the fish that have been uh, observed portside. Moving to the trawl data, again, similar story, a lot of data, this case uh, over 46,000 records. You'll see the dates are a little bit shorter, that's because this is when in the late 80s the Science Center expanded their bottom trawl survey to include maturity of Atlantic herring, not just you know numbers and weights. So the maturity stage is what's being uh, mapped on the figure on the right, and it's really again the ripe plus ripe and running stage for Atlantic herring. Similar kind of a 
along the northern edge of Georgia's bank. And this is, again, over time. We also looked at these breaking it out over a decade. So really interesting information over time. The third data set is the larval toes that I mentioned. Again, very similar story. Again, a lot of data, so we were able to break it out by, by year and also looked at this over by season. But 13,000 toes are in this data set, um, but then you can get down to the very small herring larvae and the over 2,000 toes is what's, to, what's shown in the figure. Again, in similar places. So we are seeing this trend. This is not a surprise. Uh, I think this is what people would have expected, but it's nice to see all of this data um, in, in agreement. The months that were the highest frequency of this small herring larvae were October and November, again, um, what you would, would expect. The Food Habits Database, again, this is a huge data set, um, not maybe as fruitful as some of the previous data sets because really there was a small selection of animals that were found to have positive ID for herring eggs, really only 113 stomachs of, of fish out of the over 600,000 samples that are available. The species that did have herring eggs was mostly haddock, a few cod and pollock, and a few flounder and sculpin. The regions where those 113 are in the blue squares on the screen, and you know this is maybe not as weighted as the other data sets that were previously shown, but again, similar kind of pockets of, of where this is being observed. Not really surprising that it's so few. It's pretty hard, I've heard, to identify fish eggs in a fish's stomach. Uh, they <laughs> break down pretty quick. Uh, so, but still, we wanted to kind of include everything that was available. The New England Council is involved in uh, essential fish habitat, and we are required to have maps and descriptions for places where we believe essential fish habitat is by species and by life stage. So we looked at specifically herring eggs, and the blue 10-minute squares on the screen, uh, this is the original definition of herring eggs, and this was used in this analysis rather than the more updated version, which is a bit more expanded, including other sources. So the research felt that this was the best depiction of, of really where the herring eggs are expected to be. So this is what was used for, for that layer. And finally, the historical spawning grounds, as I mentioned, there are a few different data sets available here and figures, but this is the one that was selected to give a sense of a historical view of Atlantic herring, where we think spawning occurred. This is from, a, from work Olson et al. in uh, 1977, and was later produced in some maps that were used for petroleum interactions offshore. So the dark red, some of the other species are these other um, displayed differently, but the dark red patches is Atlantic herring uh, believed to be spawning important grounds. So finally, all of these different data sets were put together to try to build a consensus. And so the, th the thought here is each one of those six data sets have a different color, and the, uh, kind of the core areas from each have been displayed in this figure. And the thinking of the researchers was to see where at least three of these different data sets overlapped as a starting point. Maybe it should be two, maybe it should be four, but this was the approach taken so far, is to see and highlight where, where three are overlapping. This was all presented to the Atlantic Herring Advisors and Committee in September, and um, people really grabbed onto the fact that all this information was available and started thinking about kind of two core areas uh, here on the northern flank by, by the Hague line, and then here kind of in, in the channel. <coughs> So when you highlight those two boxes, again, this is just really for illustration, nothing too specific yet, uh, and try to think about how that overlaps with the herring fishery, that was the next component of this report. And we looked at uh, fishing effort in a few different ways. This is just one example, taking the last 10 years and looking at where the fishery has been um, reporting their fishing locations. Again, uh, you see some here in area 1A, and then a few hot spots 
uh, east of the Cape and basically across the northern uh, flank of George's Bank. But there isn't really too much overlap within these two core areas for spawning. There's definitely some here, and this varies by year, and this is just an average of, of the 10 years combined. But the report looks into it in, a, in more detail. So just to give you a sense of where these two boxes overlap with existing management areas, this figure is, is really just for reference. Again, you have the dark black boxes, potentially uh, where there's maybe more data agreeing for spawning. And then you have the original ground fish mortality closed areas in purple. And this dotted line is under review. Herring Amendment 8 in the federal FMP is looking at a midwater trawl prohibited area on this dotted portion here, about 12 miles from shore, which extends out to 20 miles, which is again um, not approved yet, but that's as proposed by the New England Council. So this just gives you a sense. Both of these happen to overlap existing habitat management areas in the solid line, as well as you know decently heavily fished areas right outside in both cases. So pretty diverse uh, areas for widespread fishing, but in terms of herring, um, not as much so. So the industry interviews, I just have one slide about this. Again, uh, the key takeaways, uh, these were uh, nice conversations that the researchers had, really was that spawning, uh, the industry felt, was very variable. And it would be hard to pinpoint the exact time and location where you would be able to expect year after year spawning to occur. The spawning condition of her herring is relatively rare, people were saying, from their experience and their fishing efforts offshore. And really the data that we've looked at agreed with, with those sentiments. And the histogram on the right is showing you that same main port side data, the GSI kind of in bins, getting to more uh, ripe and running fish on the right. This is from all of the fish um, over all of those years, 17,000 fish records. Only 400 of them really are falling in this ripe and running um, portion over here. So really most of the fish observed, again, this is landed uh, by the... Um, Portside program are in these these less mature phases to the left. So very much in agreement with what uh, the data is describing as well. So finally, the research recommendations are described toward the end of the report. There's some suggestions here about enhancing portside sampling. If we had more trips uh, observed from the Georges Bank trips in particular, there would be more information. Uh, there is more sampling in the Gulf of Maine, as you would imagine. Um, it has increased over time, especially with the Massachusetts program coming online, uh, but, you know, there always could be more. There's another suggestion to look at at-sea collection of this information. Observers currently now are not documenting maturity of herring. It's possible that that could be a feasible idea moving forward uh, if people are interested in exploring that more. And finally, a fishery independent survey would probably, of course, be the best way to see what's happening, not just where the fleet is fishing, but everywhere across the resource it would be more expensive. It would probably take um, several, maybe five years, the PDT's thinking to really get a handle on, on the variability. So, uh, so those ideas are described. And the PDT just wants to remind everyone that you know the herring stock is at low abundance right now compared to where it's been in the past. So it may not be representative. What we're seeing right now may not be really where spawning happens normally. Uh, so we need to kind of keep that in mind. So this is the initial highlights from the authors. Looking at all these different data sets, it does point toward spawning in these two core locations. Uh, the data is also very supportive of September and October being the primary uh, months to focus on. Spring spawning was, was reviewed through the trawl survey. It's not seeming to be very important. Very few records were found with spawn uh, fish ripe and running. And right now, the industry is interacting minimally with these grounds. Um, a bit so more further east. So the plan development team recently had a conference call to update and review the, the more final report and uh, there was maybe a handful of things that the plan development team would like the researchers to work on for the final report but after that as I mentioned it, sometime in November this report should be finalized and presented to the New England Council at their December meeting and would be available online um, for everyone else to use. So the New England Council 
met in September, I'm almost finished here, and they did pass a motion to initiate a framework action to protect spawning of herring in herring management areas 3, 2, and 1B, so everywhere outside of area 1A. This motion did carry unanimously, and it is part of a suite of other things the council may work on next year. So the council is kind of in the middle right now of deciding what to work on next year. This is a process they go through every year, and the five items on the screen are the things that potentially could be on the list for herring. We, uh, you know, the center has already committed to doing the assessment, which is the first one. There will be an updated assessment in June, so that's a definite. The herring specifications um, could be modified following that updated assessment for the next three years. So again, that's probably pretty much a definite that we would be working on that. So numbers three, four, and five um, are kind of the potential things that would be worked on. The herring committee looked at those um, to date, and they have already provided input to the council that they would rank this action on spawning above the others. So that's the current um, input from the herring committee. Each individual council member will now go through the process of thinking about what they think is important, and then finally at the December council meeting, they'll make this final decision. So um, it appears, at least for now, that the spawning issue is the priority that would be added to the mix of things to be worked on next year. They have already had this motion from above that's been passed unanimously, so that basically starts the process, and the bulk of this work um, most likely would occur in, in 2020. In terms of the other topics, the mackerel related issues, if those get added, it just might extend the amount of time um, that some of these things can take if people want to try to work on all of them. So I'm just trying to give you this background to give you a sense. I know this is an important topic for the, the folks here, and the council is working on it. And probably by the December council meeting would be the, the most apparent, clear way that we'll know um, where we'll be with this topic. But for now, the council's definitely initiated this framework and is starting work. I think that's all I have. Great. Deidre, that was a great uh, update. I appreciate the council's work on this. There's a lot of good work has been done, and uh, we look forward to seeing the uh, final report from GMRI in December. Uh, is there any questions from the board? Dr. Pierce. Good, Deidre. Thank you for that. Um, would you be willing to speculate, uh, as the staff are involved in all of this, that uh, from what we've heard, from what we've read in that report that's been provided in uh, draft form, that the council will be considering spawning closure protection in those relatively small blocks that were identified as a consensus spawning area, with the potential to expand those areas, uh, if indeed they should be expanded based upon the research that's going to be done following up with those recommendations made by the PDT. Uh, I'm kind of getting the impression that's where we're going, and just curious as to whether you have, might have the same perspective or, or something different. Sure, David. I've worked at the council long enough never to speculate about what they'll do. But um, I'll humor you since this is your last um, meeting. Um, yes, uh, the Herring Committee was headed in that direction, and they highlighted those boxes as uh, kind of direction, initial direction to the Herring PDT, as well as some sort of potential expanded type of approach. As you know, when that got to the council table, the thought was, well, before we get too specific, let's see the final report report, see where things are headed. So I, I crystal ball, yes, the action will likely include several alternatives because they always do, and they it probably will start with where that report finished and, and probably some expansions. There were lots of other conversations, though, about, um, well, what gear types are we talking about? Is this just the herring fishery? Are there other fisheries included? Uh, we need to really spend more time looking at some, some monthly impacts on the fishery. You know, it might not look, it might look one way when it's the entire entire year, but quite a different story if you're just looking at the fall and things like that. So we, we definitely have um, a bit ahead of us in terms of really knowing what the, the universe of alternatives may be. And uh, Peter Kendall is here, the chair of the Herring Committee, if he wants to add anything else about his predictions of where the action will go, since he gets to help craft that um, more than I do. Um, but, but I think that would be, people should feel comfortable that there will be likely a, a range of alternatives um, similar in in spirit of, of what we've seen so far I would imagine 
Thank you, Deidre. I have a feeling we might be doing a lot of humoring of Dr. Pierce as the week goes along. Richie White. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, great report, a lot of data that you've uh, given to us clearly. Um, <clears throat> I could use a uh, little humor on this answer to this question. Um, if it's uh, this is chosen for high priority, what's the best case scenario timeline that this could be implemented? Uh, thank you for asking that question because I meant to mention that during my slides and, and uh, forgot to. So if the council really uh, seriously starts council PDT uh, working on this with the committee most likely after the priorities discussion in December, you know, we'd really get going uh, in January in reality. And, uh, you know, it would take probably at least one council cycle to look at the alternatives, another council cycle to look at, at the impacts. So, you know, best case scenario, we could have a final action in June. I think that's pretty aggressive um, from some of the issues that have come up. But even if they take final action, you know, through the federal program, there's still lots of review that happens later. So I did want to make it clear today that even if the, we have a package by June and the council takes final action on it, it would not be in place for that fall spawning season in in 2020. So I think um, people should should hear that and appreciate that to kind of manage expectations. Um, that, that if it if it went as normal, even under a good scenario, that would it, people should think more, you know, not in place by fall. Uh, any additional questions for Deidre? I'm conscious of the time here. We've got about 20 minutes left on uh, for the slime time slot for the board. Doug Grau. Just a quick question, Deirdre. Um, the, the work that GMRI did was well above what I expected there was that kind of data for. And I was kind of curious, do you think something similar could be done from the Gulf of Maine by them if someone was to uh, contract them to do it? Do you, do you think they have the information up there? Sure. So the data sets that they've focused on so far have not included Area 1A for the most part, but those obviously exist. And I have spoken about this with them briefly, um, just as a curiosity myself. And and yes, all of these data do exist for Area 1A as well. And I'm, you know, sure if someone was willing to pay for it, uh, they would they would be interested. It takes long for money to come up. <laughs> Any additional questions? Seeing none, let's move on to um, item number six, which is review and set the 2020-2021 fishery, fishery specifications. This is a final action, and Kirby has a few slides on this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just give a second to get it set up. All right. So, uh, as Deirdre has mentioned, the council approved uh, Framework 6 in June of this year. Uh, that contains 2019 to 2021 specifications and a new overfishing definition consistent with the 2018 benchmark assessment. Um, because they incorporated that information, it required them to go through a framework process. The framework has been submitted to uh, National Marine Fisheries Service for review, and it proposes a lower catch limit for Area 1A sub-ACL for 2020 and 2021. It would decrease to 3,344 metric tons based on the ABC control rule proposed in Amendment 8. So that's approximately a 23% decrease from 2019 levels. In terms of other uh, key specifications that were approved as part of Framework 6 uh, by the Council, the management uncertainty buffer uh, was set at 4,560 metric tons. Previously, uh, it had been set at 6,000 metric tons, and just as background, this management uncertainty buffer is that difference between the ABC, the acceptable biological catch, and the ACL, the annual catch limit. Uh, so it was uh, uh, set at this new level based on 10 years worth of uh, data from the Canadian catch. Basically, we take the information that comes out of the Canadian uh, New Brunswick weir fishery, and that is accounted for through this management uncertainty buffer to ensure that it doesn't uh, cause the total catch combined, that plus U.S. catch, uh, to go over the ABC. 
the border transfer was set at 100 metric tons. Uh, basically, this applies to fish caught in Area 1A by U.S. fishermen that is uh, transferred to Canada via a Canadian carrier. The fish must be for human consumption, and until 2019, it had been set uh, much higher at about 4,000 metric tons. In terms of specific to the sub-ACLs, uh, Area 1A was apportioned 28.9% of the ACL. Uh, it also maintained the, sub, uh, the seasonal sub-ACLs. So for Area 1A, zero quota would be att attributed to January through May and 100% from June through December. The 2021 specifications will likely be revised based on the 2020, bench or 2020 stock assessment update uh, that would be completed next year. And the target implementation date for this framework and these specifications is January 1. So with that, I'll take any questions for this portion of my presentation. Any questions for Kirby? Seeing none. Got another one? Yeah. All right, I'll continue on to uh, Area 1A specifications. So what this board typically does is approve specifications as recommended by the New England Fishery Management Council, as well as a motion to allocate how that sub-ACL for Area 1A will be divvied up either seasonally, by trimester, or bimonthly, uh, and then also specifying that the fishery would close when 92% of the seasonal uh, period quota has been harvested, and that any un under would be rolled into subsequent um, allocation periods. Now, a decision point for this board today is because Framework 6 has not been approved by NOAA yet, um, this board could, similar to last year, punt and, and deal with the actual specifications in February of next year, or you could choose today to set them as approved by the council, understanding they may be adjusted for any overages that occur this year. That aside, uh, this board still needs to set the uh, allocation of the 2020 Area 1A sub-ACL uh, at this meeting today. So as a reminder, per Amendment 3, uh, the board can consider distributing the sub-ACL using bi-monthly, trimester, or seasonal uh, quota periods. The board can also decide whether quota from January 1 through May 31st would be allocated to later in the fishing season and just as a reminder this is how we had the uh, quota allocated this year uh, basically we had a four bi-monthly quota period first period was June uh, that was rolled into July which uh, is part of period two which has July and August and then there's period three September October period four November through December and the approximate um, allocations are on the screen there are other options in terms of divvying up the quota. These are all laid out in the amendment. Um, I want to make clear, though, that if there is an interest in coming up with a different allocation scheme than what is laid out in Amendment 3, that would require an addendum. So again, um, decision points today, uh, whether to set the sub-ACL for 2020 and then the need to allocate that sub-ACL throughout the fishing season. Um, the other thing that can be considered that Renee talked about earlier in her presentation today was uh, the management tools that are currently in the toolbox. So current tools include landing days by permit category, weekly landing limits, the use of carriers for Category A permits during June through September, and landing days only for October through December. So making any changes, adding you know, new tools to that toolbox would also require an addendum. So with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Any questions for Kirby? Yeah. Dennis Abbott. Thank you, Mr. Chair. With the lower sub-ACL, has anyone done the math as to what the divisions of tonnage would be per bi-monthly period at this time? 
I have not, and I'm not sure. I don't believe anybody else has Low. off the top of our head. Low. I think low was the accurate description. Yeah. Any additional questions? So we do have the task of allocating the Area 1A sub-ACL through the fishing season, or is there interest in uh, waiting on that to see what the council action is going to be? No, we have to set that today. Oh, we have to, no, we have to set that one today. Yeah. So by period, so we can either by monthly or or make a change. I do know there were a lot of comments in regards to um, concerns with the bi-monthly uh, over uh, this season versus the normal process of using trimesters. I don't know if anybody else has had comments of that type made. Mr. Train, do you have a question? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I have a motion, but I don't know if we need to set the quota before the before this comes in or out. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure where we are in the ABC category here in order. So what is it you need now, and would the motion for an addendum be in place now or after we set? So, as mentioned before, typically at this meeting, the board would approve the specifications as recommended by the New England Council. Because they have not been approved by NOAA Fisheries yet, this board could wait to approve the sub-ACL, that total ACL, until February. Or, Today, you could move to approve the 2020 specifications as recommended by the council. So that's, that's something that can be decided today or moved on. What has to be decided today is how you divvy up the quota, the sub-ACL for the 2020 fishing season. That's laid out in Amendment 3. Steve, you have a follow up on that? Not so much a follow up, but I hate making decisions based on not all the information. So I, I understand we normally do, but I think we should wait. We haven't got all the info. And then I think by the time we have all the info, we could have another tool. So um, I guess I'm, I, I could move to initiate an addendum if, it will, if we're not out of time series order on this, I'll, I'll make it now. Yeah, we, we need to deal with setting uh, the periods first, um, and then based on that, if your interest is in an addendum to address additional tools in the toolbox, um, you can make that after we finalize the, the process in which we're going to move forward with. So either the, the, he showed a slide with several options on how to proceed. We could mirror what we did last year, um, which is bi-monthly periods, or we could go back to trimesters as we've done in the past. Doug Grout. Um, <laughs> realizing that we may initiate an addendum to try and put more tools in the toolbox, what I would suggest is that we, um, I have a motion to try and put some specifications in for now until uh, such time as we decide on this potential addendum that we're moving forward with. And, they, and essentially what it be is to mirror what we did last year. And if you'd like me to read that motion into the, the record, I'd be happy to do that. Why don't you go ahead and do that, Doug? Okay, I move to allocate the 2020 Area 1A sub-ACL bi-monthly in a manner consistent with the options in Table 5 in Section 4.2.3.2 of Amendment 3. That is labeled no landings prior to June 1. 
with June as a one month period. This results in the following distribution. Period one, in parens June, 16.4%. Period two, July slash August, in parens, 40.1%. Period three, September slash October in parens, 34.0%. Period four, November, December, 9.5%. Um, the fishery will close when 92% of the seasonal period's quota have been harvested and any underages from one period may be rolled into the following period. And if you're looking for the wording of that, I can either email it to you or you can pull it up from last year's uh, meeting and, and uh, um, just change the year on it. I think Max is pulling that up now. He's got something. You need to check. While he's finalizing that, is there a second to that motion? Everybody wants to read it first. Yeah. monthly and put periods in a manner consistent with the option. Okay. <clears throat> All set, Doug? Yes. Yes. All right. So we have a motion on the board. Um, everybody had a chance to review the motion. We have a second for that motion. There is no second for the motion. It fails for lack of a second. Anybody want to take a different shot? Dr. Pierce. Yeah, I don't believe that the bi-monthly approach was that useful. I believe it presented difficulties regarding monitoring the fishery and making decisions about opening and closing. the fact that we use the bi-monthly approach uh, this year. However, I wasn't satisfied with the bi-monthly approach and neither were a lot of individuals who had to live with that particular approach in terms of opening and closing fisheries, cutting the number of days. So I would make a motion to return to the trimester approach using the previously established trimester allocations. A motion by Dr. Pierce. Do we have a second? We have a second from somebody way down in the end. <laughs> from Joe. Thank you, Joe. So we have a motion and a second. Um, discussions on the motion while it's being typed. Doug Grout. Dr. Pierce, um, 
does this include uh, the aspects of uh, rollover into subsequent periods? Does it also include the aspect that we normally don't open the fishery until June 1, or are you intending to have it open January 1st? Because without that kind of uh, details in the motion, um, it, the fishery opens January 1. It would include the it would include the same provisions, the same details that we used when we had the trimester approach, which would mean we're not starting January one. It would be the June first date, so as not to complicate matters and go back too far in time where it didn't work very well. I believe this procedure worked well. Um, not everyone might agree with it, but I still believe that there. Um, that it's um, more favorably um, considered by, by the industry and certainly by, by me. Thank you, Dr. Pierce. Um, would, Doug, was your, was, is your concern about the ability to set with zero landing days to move fish later into the, into the summer? Because we'd still have that ability under the trimester approach. No, my, my concern was that I wanted to make it, make sure it was clear because we had, when we set the uh, trimester approaches, uh, we had more details in the motion. And um, if, and one of the, the uh, aspects was that the fishery would not start until June 1st. And without that, it starts July 1, uh, January 1, excuse me. Tony? David, if it was your intention to do it as we had in the past, I could help you out um, with some percentages and some language if you would, if you need it. Yeah, Tony, I would appreciate that. I haven't got that information yep. uh, readily available. We'll put it up on the board for you, and then you can read it. in your mouth, David, does that cover what you were trying to do? And as well as the seconder, Joe? Yeah, those are the right words in my mouth. Good, so those, uh, that is, I, I, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll read it into the record. Um, this has been approved and uh, agreed upon by the motion, maker of the motion and the seconder. Move to allocate the 2020 area 1A sub ACL seasonally with 72.8% available from June through September and 27.2% allocated from October through December. The fishery will close when 92% of the seasonal periods quota has been harvested and underages from June through September may be rolled into the, into the October through December period. Motion by Dr. Pierce, seconded by Mr. Semino. Any questions or comments on the motion? Mr. Train. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For the same reason I didn't uh, second Doug's motion as I was trying to get clarification on whether if this passes, um, will it preclude us from using any other tools we put in the toolbox uh, if we do um, at our May and June or July meetings. Yeah, there, there, that would not happen. If, if we initiate an addendum, the addendum passed, and the board voted in the affirmative, um, those tools will, tools will be available to the board. Any additional, Eric Reed? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, are we going to roll over if there's any underages, or are we just going to think about it? This says we may roll it in. So are we gonna we're gonna roll it in or are we gonna have to talk about it and then the season will be over before we make a decision. Should it be shall be rolled over or how's that gonna work? Tony. It does roll every time. Um, if you wanna change the word to shall we can. But we have previously in the past if there has been something left over, it automatically rolls over. I have one perfection. We, had, we have a, potentially another perfection that needs to be made here along with that one. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, Dr. Pierce, uh, just so you're clear, with this motion, we don't often have definitive information that's saying that we're at 92% of the quota period. We go off of projected harvest. So we just want to make sure that that's clearly understood and we can modify this motion to make sure it says projected harvest. Is that fine by you? That's fine by me. That's the way we've already done it. I assume that would be the case um, again. Is that all right with the second of the motion? Joe's good. Um, do we need to add the word? Yeah. Doug. I believe the way we've done it in the past, and I'll let Renee clarify this or not, was that the final 95% is when it's projected. But um, is it that the 92% is when we reach it? This has been a point of contention in the yes. past. Um, from a, a procedural standpoint, projected to be harvested would give us more control to not have an overage in a trimester. So there's, there is adding projected and then shall from May to shall um, that has been brought up by Eric Reed. Is that also um, okay by the maker of the motion and seconder? We've got no heads nodding. So Max, you could change that as well. This is a final action, so this is a roll call vote. I'm going to I'm going to read the motion one final time since we've perfected it. Uh, is, before I do, is there any additional questions? Um, no need to caucus, I'm assuming, seeing none. Um, move to allocate the 2020 area 1A sub-ACL seasonally with 72.8% available from June to September and 27.2% allocated from October through December. The fishery will close when 92% of the seasonal, seasonal periods quota has been projected to be harvested and underages from June through September shall be rolled into the October through December period. Motion by Dr. Pierce, seconded by Mr. Semino, this is a roll call vote. Kirby. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll go down starting with Maine. Yay. New Hampshire? Yes. Massachusetts? Yes. Rhode Island? Yes. Connecticut? Yes. New York? Yes. New Jersey? Yes. New England Fishery Management Council. Yes. National Marine Fisheries Service. Abstain. Eight in favor. Motion passes. Eight in favor. One with one abstention and no no votes. So, all right, Kirby, where are we then? And uh, we've got to... Mr. Train, did you have a motion that you were planning on making? If it's time, yes, I do. Any, is, unless there's additional questions, I think now is the time. Uh, I think you may have a copy of it already if you want to put it up, and I'd be happy to read it if you'd like. That looks like the right one. So I move to initiate an addendum to expand the quota period options in Amendment 3 by adding options which address challenges experienced in low quota scenarios, frequent starting and stopping of fishing days, small amounts of quota left at the end of the year. Uh, the addendum should include 
but does not have to be limited to an option which allocates 100% of the Area 1A quota to the months of June to December. The addendum should also consider expanding the small mesh bottom trawl fleet days out provision to all Category C and D permits. A motion by Mr. Train. We have a second. Second by Doug Grout. And would you like to give any further information on the motion? I'll try to be brief. Um, as uh, uh, Commissioner Pierce uh, pointed out, the start and stop fishery isn't good for anybody, and this would allow us to uh, consolidate the fishery into a shorter time period and make it more efficient. Thank you. Richie White. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I certainly support this motion. <clears throat> you can see right now we have uh, presently have 295 metric tons left for the last <clears throat> uh, period this year, you know, which makes no sense at all. And uh, this would give us the ability to address a situation like that. Thank you, Richie. Any additional comments? Seeing none, um, I'll quickly read the motion into the record. Uh, move to initiate an addendum to expand the quota period options in, in Amendment 3 by adding options which address challenges experienced in low quota scenarios, frequent starting and stopping of fishing days, small amounts of quota left at the end of the year. The addendum should include but not have to be limited to an option which allocates 100% of the Area 1A quota to the months of June through December. The addendum should also consider expanding the small mesh bottom trawl fleet days out provision to all Category C and D permits. Motion by Mr. Train, seconded by Mr. Grout. Is there any objections to the motion? Seeing no objections, the motion passes without objection. Thank you. Is there anything else under item number six? Seeing none. Um, item number seven is an update on the main enforcement efforts. Uh, Major Beal, are you still in the room? It's not hiding any longer. If you could have a seat at the public microphone. Um, uh, Major Beal is going to give a, a very brief update on the enforcement actions that we have dealt with uh, in Maine uh, pertaining to Atlantic Herring. Um, I just want to um, uh, reiterate before he does that that there are many things that he will not be able to answer questions on because there is still some ongoing investigative activity associated with, uh, with this case. Major Beal. Uh, thank you and good morning. Uh, I'll tell you that uh, a little nervous in being here because I hear about the length of my probation on a daily basis from Commissioner Kelleher. And it, and it may be longer depending on how you do. Yes, sir. <laughs> So as the uh, Commissioner mentioned, it's an ongoing investigation. Uh, it was a, essentially a one-month investigation to the herring fishery um, with some oversight between uh, Portland and Rockland Harbors. Um, the, the investigation as a whole resulted in about eight charges. Um, Mainly targeted at one uh, one fishing vessel, the Western Sea. We ended up with um, three DMR hail violations, uh, three violations for exceeding the 160,000 pound uh, weekly landing limit, and then we also had a wholesale dealer that was failing to report and was also in violation of holding any herring permit. At the end of it, uh, from this, just a single landing date, a uh, single trip uh, for uh, September 8th and 9th, we seized uh, approximately 140,000 pounds of fish. And that's generally the condensed version of our effort in Maine. Thank you, Major Wheel. Is there any questions to the Major? Dr. Pierce. I'm not sure if the major can handle this one, but I'll uh, ask anyways. Uh, uh, first of all, I'm disappointed in the uh, the actions of the owner of the Western Sea. I've got great respect for him, worked with him for many years, so this was a great disappointment to me in terms of uh, what has happened, allegedly. Uh, what, um, um, what might be the... 
what are the um, the choices or the the options for for penalties that would be considered uh, if indeed this moves forward and um, the operator is found uh, found guilty of this, uh, this uh, rule violation? Uh, monetary fine, uh, uh, suspension of permit. I know in my agency I'm rather liberal. Well, I shouldn't say liberal. I, I tend to suspend permits or revoke permits uh, because these are very significant uh, violations uh, impacting the, the good work that we do as, uh, as a board. So uh, what, what are the nature of the penalties that might be, uh, might be um, used? So the, um, thank you for that. The, the, these are all civil violations uh, in the state of Maine. Uh, under our um, civil code, the, the fines are, are fairly minor, frankly. Um, uh, Major, you can remind me what the range of the fines are for those? Yeah, uh, as Commissioner mentioned, they're all civil offenses, and the, the, the fine caps at $500. Yeah. So insignificant. The, the major penalty will come from uh, license suspensions. Um, uh, there are three individuals who will go through that process. Um, we are still in the process of determining whether that will be through the, our administrative process or um, suspensions after uh, a conviction, two, two very different processes that we have in Maine. Um, and uh, the individual, it's not, a, a final decision has not been made and a, and a recommendation has not been made by Maine Marine Patrol yet, but uh, we can suspend any and all licenses. So um, we could take lobster licenses associated with this case too. Um, and because of the severity, I'm sure uh, the patrol will uh, be considering those type of recommendations before they come to my office. Um, there is also uh, cooperation um, with no OLE on this. Uh, so there could be additional actions taken um, by NOAA uh, as well uh, in regards to permit. Any additional questions, Richie? Uh, have a comment. I don't, do you want questions or is comments appropriate? Okay, thank you. Um, first, I'd like to commend the state of Maine for taking such a, an action. Uh, uh, my understanding is it was quite a major effort uh, to do this. Um, the size of this uh, overage uh, in these low quota uh, era is substantial and I think brings great concern uh, <clears throat> to uh, the amount of uh, law enforcement and or uh, regulations we have in place. Um, there are many rumors circulating around in the fishing industry that this was not a one-time event in the industry, not saying for this vessel. Um, so my suggestion would be uh, that we send to the Law Enforcement Committee a uh, request to do a white paper to um, analyze all our existing law enforcement efforts and then for them to look at whether we need anything additional uh, from a regulatory standpoint or um, whether there needs to be some uh, new initiatives or additional efforts uh, to make sure this doesn't happen uh, again uh, going forward. Um, <clears throat> there is some uh, possible money available uh, if states did need some additional resources to carry out uh, any uh, big efforts. Um, <clears throat> I talked to the director and we do have plus up money for um, Area 3 spawning uh, protection research, which we probably will not need now, and it would, he said it would be appropriate that we could use some of that money towards uh, hiring enforcement if, if that was uh, needed. So that would be an additional tool that the Law Enforcement Committee could look at. So that would be my suggestion, uh, Mr. Chair, and I'd make a motion if that's necessary. But. Um, well, let's, uh, I'm not sure it will be necessary. Is there any uh, any thoughts or comments on uh, the points that Richie's bringing up? Basically, if I understand it, Richie is just to remand this back to the law enforcement committee to have them review practices and procedures associated with 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 herring enforcement. Uh, correct. 
um, would you, you suggested a white paper. Do you think we need to be as formal as a white paper or could it just be a report back to this committee? Whatever law enforcement, I think, you know, whatever method they would uh, deem to report back to us. The, uh, the chair of the law enforcement committee was whispering in my ear, a report back would be great. Um, um, is there any, um, I'm not sure we need a motion on this, I, is there any objections to uh, having law enforcement committee um, uh, review practices and procedures associated with herring enforcement? Seeing none, um, we'll, uh, we'll make sure that that is brought to the hearing committee for further discussion. Uh, thank you for bringing that up. Is there any additional questions or comments for Major Beal? If not, Major, you can take one month off your four-year long suspension. I, I, not suspension, excuse me. It was almost a suspension, probation. It's one of those slips that is probably more accurate when I say it, but yeah, thank you. Um, item number eight um, is an election of vice chair. This is an actionable item. Uh, is We have a hand up, Dr. Pierce. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think as most people know, I'm retiring, therefore I cannot take on the role uh, of chair uh, at our uh, next business meeting. So uh, I just have a suggestion to make for consideration uh, by the board, and that is to uh, have as my replacement, so to speak, a member of my staff who frankly does all the hard work on sea herring at this time and has for quite a long time. That's uh, Dr. Catherine O'Keefe, uh, known as Kate, and uh, Kate uh, is in the audience. Kate is a member of the uh, New England Fishery Management Council uh, Sea Herring Committee, acting as my proxy. And she has been, I think, uh, Maine and New Hampshire representatives uh, thoroughly understand she has been involved in all the calls related to uh, Sea Herring Days and other issues related to Sea Herring Management at the interstate level. So uh, I would just make a suggestion to you, Mr. Chairman, that uh, instead of me, as I depart, that, uh, that uh, Dr. Catherine O'Keefe uh, should be uh, elected uh, vice chairman chair. We have a nomination of, uh, of Catherine Kate O'Keefe, who did not run out of the room at the suggestion. Um, uh, Eric Reed. And Eric Reed has seconded uh, that uh, nomination. Any, any questions or comments on the nomination? Now's your chance to get your digs in on Kate. Any objections? Seeing none, congratulations, Kate. And um, that brings us to other business. Is there any other business to be brought before the hearing board? Seeing none, a motion to adjourn would be in order. Several motions to adjourn. The meeting is, uh, is in. Thank well, you very much. We'll start the lobster board as quickly as possible, so hopefully in five, five-ish minutes.